But last week we celebrated Epiphany. And we learned, as I shared with the children this morning, that the word Epiphany means an illuminating discovery. But even though we use the word discovery a lot, what exactly is a discovery? I think usually we think of it as finding something new. But that isn't entirely correct if we think about it. Let me give you an example. Suppose that I discover there's actually a mini golf place close to my house. It's not that the mini golf place wasn't there before, it's been there for 30 years. It's just I didn't know about it. So the thing I discovered is actually old, it's just new to me. Well, today in our Old Testament reading and our Gospel readings, there are people who experience this sort of discovery as well. In this case, they're discovering God. It's not that he wasn't there until they discovered him. He's been there all along. It's just only upon discovery do they realize that he's been there with them. In the case of our Old Testament reading, he's been speaking literally to him, and they didn't know it was his voice. And in our Gospel They thought they had found Jesus, but it turns out he found them. So let's start by looking at that Old Testament reading, because there's a lot in here that can help us not only be comforted as disciples, but really know where the foundation of our faith in Christ lies. So young Samuel is in the temple, and he hears a voice calling to him, saying his name, Samuel. And I think like most people, he's assuming there's a person calling his name, and he thinks it's Eli, and so he goes and says to Eli, here I am, here I am, for you called me. And Eli says, I didn't call you, go back and lie down. And this happens two more times, almost exactly the same, with a few different words. And then... Notice that it isn't just Samuel who doesn't know it's God. Eli doesn't recognize the voice of God yet either. But the third time when Eli comes to, or when Samuel comes to Eli and says, Here I am, for you called me. The text says that Eli perceived that it was the Lord speaking to him. Eli has made this discovery. But notice that God's been there even before Eli realizes it's him, and he instructs Samuel. When you hear the voice call your name again, say, Speak, Lord. And you'll notice in the text, the Lord is in all caps, which means it's Yahweh, the name of God. Speak, Yahweh, for your servant hears. Has this ever happened to you? Not the vision and the voice part, but the discovery or realization that God has been, in fact, trying to speak to you for quite a while. And you've only now realized. That's the way that kind of works sometimes, right? Maybe you've been praying that God would give you wisdom about a new decision or venture, about where to go to school or what job to take, or maybe whether or not your family should move. And in the moment of realization for us, we typically think back and we realize that God has been answering our prayers and speaking to us and has been present even when we didn't realize it. And only now can we see what it is that he's been up to. Because like Samuel and Eli, God's been speaking to us already. We just didn't recognize his voice. And then when we discovered that it was God himself, that we would say, maybe sometimes we express it by saying, we found him. What we discover is the reality that he actually has already found us. See, God still works this way in the New Testament, and we get to our gospel reading today. We'll hop forward a number of centuries to when Jesus is calling his first disciples in the book of John. And the interaction here between Jesus and his brand new disciples illustrates one of the great comforts and mysteries of our faith. So we start at verse 43 where Jesus decides to go to Galilee, and the text says this, He found Philip and said to him, follow me. The very next verse, Philip goes and finds his friend Nathanael and says to him, we have found Jesus, right? We have found the one who Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Isn't that interesting? Did you catch the shift there? Who found whom? Really is the question here. 
The text says that Jesus found Philip, but then he turns around and tells his friend that it's in fact they who have found Jesus. And this trend continues with Nathaniel's interaction with Jesus as well. He doubts Philip's words at first, and his response is sort of snide. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But Philip insists, and he says, and he humors him, and he says, all right, I'll go check this guy out. Well, Nathaniel, when he's coming to see Jesus, that Philip has spoken to him about, he perceives that this is the first time that they're meeting. He doesn't know Jesus, and Jesus doesn't know him. They're strangers. They've never met. But then Jesus greets him as if he knows him. He says, behold, an Israelite indeed in which there is no deceit. And quite naturally, Nathaniel is confused by this greeting and says, how do you know me? And here's where he makes his discovery. Jesus responds, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So even before the person that Jesus sent his new disciple to go tell Nathaniel, Jesus knew Nathaniel. He saw Nathaniel. And then, of course, his confession that he, Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel, which are all messianic titles from the Old Testament. He understands that this is the one. This is the Messiah. But see, in both cases, God has already been at work in the lives of the people who interact with him and they just don't quite realize it yet they haven't made that discovery or it hasn't been revealed to them so what is it exactly that they do discover when the realization is made clear to them like when i sent lucas to find the bible here in the church somewhere what they discover while God reveals specifically different information to Samuel and Philip and Nathaniel and to us, the basic discovery is the same. That God has been here all along, speaking to you, seeking you. He knows you already. You come into the interaction thinking you're strangers, but you're not. He sees you and knows you and seeks you out still. Now even in some cases, like Philip, we think that when he finds us, it's the other way around, that we found him. In our reading, Philip gives a testimony about Jesus. It's a short one because he just met him, but it's a testimony. And something we don't really typically do in Lutheran circles partially because of of this confusion. Have you ever heard someone give their testimony about how they came to faith in Christ? They're usually talking about how they found God or they accepted Christ. But the longer you listen to their story, it's quite clear they weren't really in control anywhere along the path that led them to Christ. They met some random person on a plane who said something to them they'd never heard before, which caused them to seek out a church and talk to a pastor. Or maybe somebody just gave them a Bible, but even in a simple action like that, it turns out that when you come to faith, you realize that was God. He sent that person to speak to you or to give you that Bible, or he brought you to a place you weren't expecting to go, and you had an encounter that you didn't see coming. It becomes clear once God reveals himself to us, either through the witness of someone else or through our own reading of the scriptures. When we look back, we realize that he's been at work far longer than we realize. See, as Lutherans, we're careful about using the language of finding God or accepting Christ. Not because everybody who says that doesn't understand that God is in control of their lives. I think many of them do. Just like Philip here is just mistaken about where it began and how it happened. But it is important to note 
that the beginning of your life in Christ did not start with you. It began with God. It began with him seeking you out, speaking to you, giving you his word, either directly or through other people. Because he is searching for you, is calling you, is gathering you to himself. Now, why does this seemingly splitting hairs kind of issue make such a big difference? Well, this discovery ought to bring immense comfort to you, not to mention joy. It means that God saw you and knows you. Now, think about what that means for a moment. All the things that you don't want other people to know about you, God knows. All the things you've ever done that you're ashamed of and the things in the future that you don't yet know that you will do that you will be ashamed of, God knows, even before you meet him. And yet still, he seeks you out to call you, to gather you to himself. See, the, realize, the realization of his activity in, in your life should be one of immense joy. That even when you had no idea he was there, you weren't looking for him, you didn't even know what choices there were for you, he was working to lead you to him. It turns out that you and I can't even consider all the possibilities, much less make the right choice. So my faith, which allows me to see, is instead given to me by my God. A God who comes to me and reveals himself to me. And then I see that he's been there all along, speaking to me through the prophets in the Old Testament and now through his Son. Even before I recognized his voice, even before I knew him, he knew me. This reality not only provides the comfort and the security that comes with knowing that my faith, my new life in Christ is resting upon the foundation of his action and faithfulness, not mine and my faithfulness. But it also gives me hope for faith in others. Think about what this means for those in your life who you pray for on a regular basis that you wish they would know Christ. I think sometimes when we pray for those people, we imagine that they're all alone, that God has abandoned them or that they can't see. And what is, our, what is God's word telling us today? Is that he is with them there. He's already speaking to them, already working to send people to them in their life to gather them to himself. Maybe that person is going to be you. Now, the frustrating thing is you don't know that. You also don't know when. could be five minutes from now or five years from now. But isn't it comforting to know that God is with them, seeking them even now? Even before they know who he is or recognize his voice or even think they want an interaction with God, he's there speaking to them. He's there pursuing them, and he knows them better than they know themselves. So dear friends in Christ, the glorious epiphany of our God in Jesus continues today. The presence of Christ on earth is the personification of this aspect of God. But he's not waiting for you and I to get it right, to figure it out, or to look for him. But instead, he sent his son to be born of a woman born under the law to bear the price of our sin in his very body because he wants to be with you. And he's going to make you his own. And it turns out that when you figured that out, he's already found you. In the name of Jesus, amen.